call is now being recorded. Okay. Why do I switch my screen? Saya pun tak tahu macam mana nak tukar skrin dia ni. Sekejap eh. <laughs> Nampak ini je yang ada. Mana nak nampak kaya ni. Tarik ke sini. Okay. So. Um, Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon. So before we go to the lecture notes. Um, but I'm showing you guys now. Uh, basically, um, the notes that I've posted, hopefully the topics that we're going to cover until the first quiz on in, in week seven. Okay. Um, so I've tried my best to actually push through. Um, hopefully we manage to go up until this lecture over here, this note over here. Um, so today I'm hoping that I can cover a little bit of just finishing up um, the notes from week four and then go into the notes on week five down here a little bit okay um and and then next week gonna cover up until week six okay and then you have your um quiz in your seventh week okay the most important thing about your quiz that i'm gonna touch here is um sorry it's a bit slow because i need to look at here otherwise i need to do this okay so have you guys heard about spectrum exam no okay so other than this course is there any other course that you guys are being told that you're going to have a final exam during your final exam week and again okay so um the requirement by the university is um if we were to do your final exam during your final exam week there are two options one is um to either do if I'm not mistaken, everything in the final exam week must be done via this spectrum exam uh, portal. Okay, so I'm going to show you guys a little bit about this and I will let you guys um, just, you know, go through, have a play, um, go around with it. Okay, um, because what I have prepared here are uh, very much a preparation quiz. Oh God, I think it should be auto, auto in. Okay, so a preparation quiz. So this one is just a trial. Um, because if you go into here, what will happen is that, um, okay, sorry, I need to change my browser setting. Oh, it's already sitting. Uh, let me see, go back to this one. Okay. So it's the same address. If you look at the address, it's just spectrum exam, one word. Okay. Just add in the exam and then, um, find your courses similarly in, in spec normal spectrum. And then you can play around with this. So what it requires you to do is, because uh, I already attempted this, um, it requires you to install um, a lockdown browser. Okay, so this one is being forced to us by the central. Um, previously, I we I even hit this one, but uh, anyhow, um, because we were asked to do it. Um, if you guys want to do exam during your exam week. If it's not the exam week, meaning that, you know, some lecturers will give you an assignment that you need to submit by week 14, we don't need to use this, okay? But because this subject, uh, I think Prof Halija is giving you an assignment, correct? Right? So in her case, submission is on the 14th week. In my case, because I don't want you guys to be burdened with all the assignments and whatnot until the end of the uh, final week. So I decided to use this. And to give you guys a little bit of practice, so um, quiz number one and quiz number two, we'll be using this platform, okay? So prior to the quiz, we just open um, the this page and then make sure you install the lockdown browser, okay? Otherwise, um, if you were to install it just during the, the quiz uh, day only, it will take a bit of time, that's one thing. And the second thing, um, if there's any issues, then it will be very difficult for me to Kind of like help you guys to troubleshoot for other issues so just go back uh, after this install and then just have a go um there's only like one question for this 
So you just go and, and try and see if the browser or, or lockdown browser works. Um, if you are the techie type, maybe you can actually um, uh, or, or just go and kind of hack the software and bypass something. Uh, I've already tried it. It's actually very easy to do, but I'm not going to ask you guys to do it because if you do it wrongly, then I will get notified <laughs> that you tried to, you know, you, you attempted to change the software. So um, I'm not going to ask you guys to do it, but I'm just telling you guys. In case if you are thinking of doing it, don't. Okay. So uh, make sure you try this before our seventh week. Okay. And um, as you try, if there's any issues, let me know. Okay. So, and then second one, I'm going to show you guys this. Have you guys opened this? Have anyone tried opening the link that I give you guys? Let me tell you. Are they try. Are they? Okay, so basically, these two um, kind of like website is an open source website that is available for anyone who are uh, like wants to do um, research on proteins or um, do a little bit of analysis on proteins. So you can use these two websites. Um, so what it shows you is, remember the EC number that we've learned? Okay, so this is the number um, that identifies an enzyme. So if, say, for example, if we put in 11117, one, one, we do search. Okay, so basically you can find the name of the enzyme uh, and then what it does and so on and so forth. Huh? So basically there's, there's a lot of information here that you can click that links to the corresponding enzymes. Okay, so... Um, this is just to let you guys know. I'm not going to go in very detail because you're not going to do any uh, assignments on it. Um, last time, students were doing assignments, so that's why I, I actually spent like one lecture to explain this and that. And the second one is, uh, we call it as protein data bank. This is where you can find all information about all known proteins, crystal structures, like uh, the functions of the proteins, the related research article related to the proteins. So if you search there are two keywords either you search the name of the enzyme itself or that's what we call as pdb id so it's a unique identification of that particular uh, protein or enzyme again this one is not focusing just on enzymes it's involving everything every single protein that is being identified for example um one oan is um an e protein on a dengue virus okay so um it looks like that you can actually play around with it but somehow it doesn't want to work. Um, that's a 3D view if you want to view it in three dimensional and rotate it and whatnot. Okay, so um, it's it's a very useful um, database for those who are interested in doing research. Like in my case, I do a lot of research on proteins and peptides. Um, I actually use a lot of this to find the information that I wanted. Um, and um, when you guys learn about computational chemistry a little bit, like molecular docking little bit about molecular dynamics, right? So we actually use this website um, as the kind of like the the beginning of our research. When you are, want to do dockings and whatnot, you need to have the crystal structure of your enzymes or proteins, for example. And this website is the one that we use to get the crystal structure. Then from here, you can get it uh, into your computer. Then you have your own, um, say, molecules that you want to dock. Then you will combine these together and, and get your information, okay? So that is all for this one. I think I covered everything. Okay. So let's move back to our lecture. Meet podcast. Then okay. Everybody can see your friends. Hi. So now I have a few more. <laughs> okay. It's a jua. I need to move around. Okay. So last week we went through um, some driving forces that influences enzymatic activity. Let me see. Um, okay. So influences catalytic processes. We went through a little bit on 
um, some examples. For example, here, probably should do that. That will be there. Okay, we've looked at the driving forces, the ionic interaction, hydrogen bonding, dipole, uh, van der walls, even though this is your first year chemistry, we just went through it uh, a little bit. Okay, we went through anti long hydrophobic, and this is where we stop. Okay, so, um, so just continue on from hydrophobic effects. So basically, this is one example on how hydrophobic effects actually influences enzymatic activity. Okay. Um, if you look at this structure over here, it's the same molecule, and then we have two um, enzymes, chemotrypsin and uh, papain. Okay, two different enzymes, but having the same um, uh, substrate can result in a different product. Okay, so this is because of um, the hydrophobic moiety inside internally inside the uh, enzyme are different. So um, as I mentioned previously, okay, and this, this picture on the top right corner, so when you have an enzyme, a glo globular enzyme, you normally have a hydrophobic effect in the middle, okay? So the sequences inside here actually influences how these two enzymes actually works. Okay, I'm not going to show you guys in very detail because it will just consume time, but um, this is basically just a general overview, just general information that the hydrophobic um, influences in an enzyme affects the activity of the enzyme itself. Okay, so that's the basic theory. Okay. Um, so this is scheme 2.2. I know it does, it's not listed in your um, lecture notes. So basically, this is again just to show you um, different types. So we have type 1 and type 2. Um, just a slight difference in terms of the... Oops in terms of the functional groups arrangement, and then you can get slightly different um, products altogether. Okay, so again, hydrophobic effects. Oops, sorry. So um, moving on from hydrophobic effects, the next one is pH dependent or effects of pH on the enzymatic activity. Um, enzyme functions, again, as a special pH, um, and as I mentioned in the very beginning of the lecture, enzymes that work in an acidic environment rarely work in a, um, if you put it in the basic, it will rarely uh, work, okay? There's always um, in a bell-shaped graph like that, whereby the optimum pH is when the enzyme is most active, and if you go in the extreme ends, either both extreme ends, you can get a lower in activity. Okay, so pH dependent. So why does this happen? It's because in all enzymes, you have uh, uh, two basic functional groups that are most abundant, most common, which are the carboxylic acid and the amine group. And of course, um, the amino group can come from um, normally lysine or arginine, histidine, and of course the N-terminal, okay? But if you consider um, a single protein uh, belongs to a single polypeptide chain, you only have one amine. But if you are considering, um, say, hemoglobin, whereby it's, uh, it's a tertiary structure having three, uh, four different uh, peptide chains, now you can see the influence is bigger. Now you have four uh, amino group at the N-terminal instead of just having one if you're considering a single uh, enzymes like that, for example, compared to um, hemoglobin, which has four different protein subunit, okay? So, um, of course, the presence of acid and bases um, or the pH buffer will have a pH buffer effect. So if you go too high, it will reduce activity. If you go too low, it will be the same, okay? So outside of the range, protein structures are affected, uh, therefore reducing or increasing um, the pH depending on the type of enzyme. And the effects can be re reversible, um, such as structural deformation, and then um, reform it again, or it can be permanent. Okay? An example of permanent um, pH disturbance is when you put in, um, say, for example, um, Sulfuric acid, which is a very, very strong pH, uh, uh, acidic, okay? 
you can deform the uh, enzyme. That's one thing. And then if it's too strong, you can pretty much uh, break the uh, carbox carboxyl peptide bond or amide bond. Okay, you you can hydrolyze the bond. Um, something that is irreversible is, for example, if you um, take out your pepsin from your stomach. Okay, so you know your stomach is very acidic. It's um, so if you put it, uh, so stomach acid is roughly about one to two. The pH is about one to two. So if you take it out and then you put it in in uh, if you wash it in in the tap water, which pH is about seven or eight. So you know that the enzyme will have very very uh, uh, least reactivity. But then if you take it uh, from the water and then put it back in the acid, it can regenerate. Okay, as long as you don't go beyond the um, do not go until you're permanently damaging your enzymes uh, then you can normally reversible okay you can regenerate the enzymes okay this is an example on um, an experiment on how ph affects the rate of reaction of an enzyme okay sorry Eklan. Okay, so this is just an, an example. Um, you can find a lot more examples. So for this enzyme, um, initial rate of enzymatic hydrolysis of pre uh, para nitrophenyl phosphate using a wheat germ acid phosphatase. Okay, so if you look at this, you can see they kind of like a little bit of a bell shape. Okay, so normally all enzyme have this kind of structure. Yes, you can see it's kind of like doing like that. It's not the perfect bell, okay, but in general, um, the bell shape is not always bell. If you do a lot of experiment, um, you will not, no one enzyme actually uh, will kind of like form a perfect bell shape. There's always, uh, depending on the um, sequence, whether the enzyme is more acidic, uh, it works in acid environment or a basic environment, you get a tattoo. So in this case, because the enzyme is more, it works better in the acidic, you'll get a um, skewed on the left-hand side if this enzyme is uh, more alkaline, um, uh, works in more an alkaline environment, then you can see the tattoo will go on the right-hand side. Okay, so normally it happens because it depends on the design of the enzyme itself. So the one that work in more uh, acidic environment, it has a lot of um, cationic uh, residues, lysine, arginine, and histidine, and vice versa. So they kind of like um, uh, be able to, um, what's the word? Boleh um, tahan sikit-sikit lah, okay? So you can withstand the change, the harsh change of, of, of pH a little bit, depending on the structure of the uh, enzyme itself. Okay, so again, if you were to draw this, so normally we will just draw a bell shape. But of course, depending on whether, if say I ask you guys to draw the enzyme function at specific pH based on activity and pH for an acidic um, enzymes, then you should draw it something like that instead. Okay, and vice versa. If it's uh, basic, then you should go the two a little bit on the right hand side and then more bell shape on the left hand side. But in general, if there is no specific name of an enzyme, then uh, the best drawing is just a bell shape like that. Okay. Now, moving on to the next one, um, temperature dependent. It works almost exactly as um, pH. Okay. Um, it's just that temperature dependent is a bit more interesting in the sense that um, if you consider all mammals, for example, so our body temperature are roughly the same. So most of mammals temperature are around 30 to 40 degrees Celsius. Okay, But um, it is interesting since there are some organism that lives in deep in the ocean where the temperature is very cold. And then there are some organisms that also live deep in the ocean um, near a volcano um, area whereby the temperature can be as hot as about 70 or 80 degrees. Okay, so um, if you just consider the general terminology, then again, it will go in a bell-shaped curve. Okay, but 
of course depending on the organism um, normally the girth will be skewed towards left hand side a little bit okay normally it's like that it's like uh, for us human if say the temperature over here is 37 degrees okay for a healthy human uh, if you say like for example what we are doing now is we are sitting in a very cold room um, in an air conditioning room the temperature might be i don't know about 20 or so but um, you consider your skin will have the least um, temperature of course if you as as you go deeper into your body the temperature will go as close to still will go as close to 37 as possible because your body kind of like regulates the temperature but if you consider your skin okay so the temperature normally is lower but um your enzymes still works your body still function okay it doesn't mean that it goes down and then straight away you're gonna die or, or it doesn't work and then something will happen you get necrosis and whatnot but um normally that's why normally okay for a mammal of course i'm just not going to generalize for all organism for mammals the skewed will be towards the lower temperature if you go to higher temperature for example you um if you have a high fever right at 39 degrees or 40 degrees people will start to kind of like be freaked out because um especially for kids because it will say something will happen to your brain and so on and so forth okay because this is because as you go higher it will be easier for the enzymes to be denatured compared to if you go lower at the lower temperature but of course if you go too low then you will still die okay all right so um we've looked at the basic um ph and temperature now just kind of go a little bit on um, the other different forces that are still uh, important in the sense that it affects your enzymatic activity and some of these um, images are being used from your SID 2004 um, but in a, in a different slightly different perspective okay so the first one you're looking at hydrogen bonding or alpha helices that normally will definitely exist in most i would say 99 percent of protein or probably 99.9 .9 of proteins okay and enzymes um so as long as you have alpha helix you will definitely have a hydrogen bond so um, again this is kind of like the description of hydrogen bond it's pointing downwards uh, roughly downwards parallel to axis of the helix so that's the helix going that way okay and pointing down so you can see that is the C double bond O over there pointing downwards, um, which is actually near to, okay, if you look at that one over there, okay, the one at the top, oops, okay, you have your C double bond O over here, and then next to it, you have an NH group, okay, so if you were to draw it in a chemical structure form, you have CO over here, and then you have an N, FH, and then C alpha, and then going down, that one is the R group. Okay, similarly, um, that one should go somewhere there. That's the R group. Okay, so, so this one is that one over there. Oh, wait, sorry. No, no, no. Oh, God. That one should be the one up here. There should be another one up here. Okay, C double bond O. So this is where your hydrogen bond comes in. That one is this group over here. Ding, 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 ding. And that one is the one up here. Okay, so you have your hydrogen bonding. And this goes throughout your um, alpha helices. Okay. The common group of each peptide bond is hydrogen bonded to NH group uh, about four, four amino acids away. All R groups are pointing outwards, as you can see over here. Okay, again, this is just kind of like a refresher for you guys. So I'm just going to go very quickly. Okay, alpha helix, again, um, stereochondrules versus other forces. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, you have your R group projecting outside from the helix. Okay. Um, this is to reduce your steric interaction. So if you put it inside, then um, you can see the length of this R group. If you put pointing it inside, it will definitely break your alpha helix. So for all alpha helix, you will not have an R group pointing inside, even if it's a um, um, glycine or a small amino acid such as um, alanine. Okay, you you will still have your 
a group pointing outside. The need of adequate separation between neighboring R groups to minimize the strain and repulsion of light charges. So uh, light charges in the sense that if you have two lysines, so instead of isoleucine like this, if you have a lysine which has an NH2 groups, okay, so to maximize the repulsion, so you are having both R groups pointing outside. Okay, so it's just a, a basic theory, kind of like recapping what it's mentioned previously. All right, so what is shown here is leucine and leucine. Oh, actually, leucine has another one, sorry. Okay, so it's leucine and leucine. Next one is um, beta, beta helix. Beta helix. Beta sheet. <laughs> Why did I put in beta helix? Okay. The, the next one is a, a beta sheet. Um, so, steric hindrance in the sense that um, you can have a parallel and anti-parallel formation. So, of course, um, you have hydrogen bonding here. This is another example of hydrogen bonding. Okay. CO group of each peptide bond oops, um, is hydrogen bonded to the end group from the neighboring chain. So, in this case, it's um, it doesn't mean that neighboring chain means it's a totally different um, peptide bond, okay? So it can still be connected to one another, okay? So neighboring peptide chain here is just uh, a peptide chain next to it. It doesn't mean that it's from a different um, amino acid polypeptide chain altogether, okay? So it can be either this way, the combination, or it can be two different peptide chain. So both um, are possible, and it all depends on the structure of the uh, protein itself, the enzyme itself. If it's a tertiary structure, then it will have one single polypeptide. If it's a quaternary, then it may have two different uh, polypeptide chains. Okay. So you have a parallel and anti-parallel uh, polypeptide chains running in the same direction. That's what we call as parallel. So same direction in the sense that um, it goes towards that way. If you follow the um, N to C, okay, for example, over here you have, so N and then C, okay, N, C, so you start with N and then C, and then you have N, C, N, C. Similarly, over here you have that as your N, that one is your C. So what I mean by N and C are the uh, N terminal N, uh, carboxyl terminal okay so you have nc and then again nc nc so it follows nc 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 but if you look at anti-parallel so you have your c and then n oops my c looks like o okay c n c n if you go towards this side you have your n c n c n c okay so this is what it means by anti-parallel and parallel. Just looking at the functional group, uh, because for peptides and proteins, normally you consider the start and the finish based on the arrangement, whether it has an N terminal or a C terminal. So that is the arrangement. Okay, so tertiary protein, uh, tertiary structure of a protein is a three-dimensional arrangement of all atoms in the protein. Protein folds spontaneously in a solution to maximize the stability. Again, I put it as spontaneously because um, sometimes it doesn't work that way. Um, of course, it works spontaneously in our body, but if you take it out, um, you synthesize it, for example, in the lab, and then you are trying to spontaneously um, fold the protein, um, it may work, it might not work. Okay, You might get a different folding altogether. Um, even for a short, um, the longest that I've, it was about 60 amino acid okay so you imagine that it will just spontaneously fold itself in the buffer solution that is suitable for that particular protein or, or enzymes but in reality if you do that you might get um, multiple type of folding okay of which one of the folding works the others doesn't work in the sense that if it's an enzyme you are hoping that the enzyme uh, may able to catalyze the reaction but if you synthesize it, because again, um, for a protein, you can synthesize it chemically or you can actually produce it uh, in uh, an organism, okay, based on our first lecture. 
Okay, so if you produce it in a biotechnological approach, then normally the enzyme just works. But if you synthesize it in the lab, which is the alternative way, uh, you might need to purify it. So towards the other day, when you uh, have your synthetic uh, enzyme or protein, you need to run HPLC analysis, and then you need to compare it. What is that? You need to compare it with um, the biotechnological uh, formed peptide or, or protein, and then you need to just kind of like purify the exact uh, retention time, then you get a chemically synthesis synthesized protein that has the same function as the ones you produce biologically. Okay, otherwise it will not work. So stabilizing interaction in the protein can occur between peptide group, side chain, and uh, peptide to side chain. So as shown in this figure. Okay, so you have hydrogen bondings over there. Um, between this one is beta sheet. We have alpha helices or different type of helices. Then you can have uh, between this one between R groups, okay? So this one is between R groups and the peptide bond itself. Um, this one again between R groups and all the driving forces affecting, uh, influencing the peptide folding, okay? Um, so this one, just skip on the picture on the right, okay? And then the last, if I'm not mistaken, um, among the driving forces are substrate specificity. So geometric fitting are very important. So there is no perfect substrate cavity. Um, again, depending on the the, the uh, theory or the models that you're using, if you're using lock and key, then of course uh, there is a perfect substrate. But um, in reality, you know that lock and key model is the first uh, model that is being kind of like um, generated or discussed among scientists a long, long time ago. Um, nowadays, there are even more advanced ones, but um, the old model that are still acceptable are the induced fit model. Okay, so the perfect substrate cavity, uh, it varies. It's yes and no, um, but that's why I put it there. Perfect. Okay, it needs to fit, but it doesn't need to be perfect, in a sense. Okay, so focus entirely on the substrate, not just the functional group. Um, so if you look at the functional group, then you know it's just forces. So if you say, for example, um, something that has a carboxylic acid group, okay, um, it might work in uh, a protein A, but it might not work in protein B. So the functional group is not important. What importance is the entire substrate. So if it has a lipid like that, so everything must fit on the active side of uh, protein A for it to work yeah, and if it doesn't fit on um, enzyme B then it will not work okay so functional groups are important in the sense that it will um, the attractive force or repulsion uh, force will attract the substrate into the active site but to the other day everything needs to fit in before it can actually work okay Specific interaction sites, uh, inclusive of all forces plus polar, extreme high specificity is possible. Okay, so what it means is that there can be a very very highly specific enzymes that work in a very very uh, specific substrate. Okay, so extremely high specificity, but again there is no, um, so far there is no one enzyme that only work with one substrate. Okay, they always. Uh, they, they, there's always an analog substrate that can work in the same uh, within the same enzyme. So catalytic active group must perfectly align with the process to work. Okay, again, this one, if you go back and look at the models, so the models kind of like um, talks about this a little bit. Okay, um, static model, lock and key, dynamic or geometric stabilized model, induced fit, and so on and so forth. So the ones that we've touched is just these two models, lock and key and induced fit. Okay. Um, lock and key model, square fitting but less geometric effect. Okay. Um, meaning that um, positioning of the catalytic active center is kind of like less important. So, say, say for example, if you have something like that, and um, the example that I've used in the uh, piece last time. Okay. So, if you consider lock and key, this might not work, okay? 
uh, even though it can fit but if you consider um, the substrate you might think oh the substrate needs to be a quarter instead of a square okay so it might not work um, it can still fit but less geometric effect so you can consider uh, it still okay it, it will still work but the geometric effect doesn't really important um, the shape of it doesn't really, it's, it's not really important as long as it fits then it will work but if you look at the induced fit model you need to make sure that um, oops you need to make sure that this bit over here and that one over there are more hydrophobic why because no as i mentioned if you have an, a globular enzyme the center of the enzyme are normally hydrophobic so for this particular square to actually fit into this enzyme that has a central um, hydrophobic residues so part of it needs to be hydrophobic okay otherwise it will not um, match properly and the enzymatic reaction will not work so say for example if you have another square but the square contains a lot of um, cations okay so you, you will know even though uh, if you consider the lock and key system it might work but um, in the induced fit model it might not work okay so domination of hydrophobic effect so that one takes priority um, no vacuum condition in the sense that everything needs to be fit properly okay interaction of non-polar uh, domains with water and substrate we did not touch in that on that many in very detail domination of van der waals interaction which are hydrophobics and all the other forces okay so coenzyme and cofactors these are um, again some of our examples that we do not touch it in very detail because all the uh, catalytic activity all the calculations we actually exclude them from um learning it here because otherwise um, enzyme reaction itself can be a, a, a lengthy um, one semester lecture okay so this is just to for you guys to know that there are coenzymes and cofactors that are important in in um, changing the shape of the active side of the enzyme so that it perfectly uh, as perfect as possible fit into a substrate before it actually catalyzes a reaction okay so a non-catalytic organic, so what, what are these coenzyme and cofactors? They are non-catalytic organic or non-organic component that are essential for a normal catalytic activity of enzymes. So say for example, uh, for hemoglobin, uh, for it to work, it needs to have uh, an iron. Okay, it needs to have an iron in the middle of the enzyme. Or um, what else is a good example? Um, insulin, for example, if I'm not mistaken, if I, if I recall correctly, you need to have a zinc um for it to actually catalyze the reaction so before this probably you will just learn that uh, insulin will just work on its own but um and experimentally it was shown that um insulin does not work on its own it normally fo uh, forming a, a dimeric structure before it catalyzes um uh, insulin is producing energy from glucose okay so um there are researchers that shown or that suggests um, insulin might work in a um, a tandem manner uh, in in a dual manner instead of individually on its own okay and so you can consider that as uh, a coenzyme or a cofactor because individually it will not work you can also have something else for example there are some enzymes uh, that work in the presence of a vitamin okay so that's why we need vitamins in our body it's not just uh, when we say you need vitamins to make sure that you are healthy, so it's not just simply healthy, healthy, but because the vitamin itself plays a key role in your body, okay? Uh, either a catalytic activity or some other um, influences, okay? So, a uh, coenzyme and cofactor are loosely, can be loosely or tightly fit or associated with the protein. So, loosely is, for example, when I mentioned about vitamin A, so normally the vitamin A is not uh, pack, tightly packed into an enzyme, but um, iron, on the other hand, uh, for a hemoglobin to work, it will be it, it will normally need to be tightly bond, meaning that it doesn't simply fuse away. It is kind of like part of the whole um, enzyme structure. Okay. So um, and the presence of enzyme cofactor may alter the geometric shape 
or it also may participate directly with the catalytic activity. So, uh, for example, um, iron that I mentioned in hemoglobin, it participated directly in oxygen transfer or carbon dioxide transfer from uh, within your blood into and out, out from your blood. But uh, vitamin A or and other cofactors that you can find very, very easily if you just Google cofactor enzyme or DNA replication, you can find a lot of uh, coenzymes that are required for the um, enzyme to work. Okay. But nonetheless, they are uh, essential for the enzymes. All right. So this is one example. Um, so when we talk about altering geometric or participate directly, so you can have something like this. So you may have a coenzyme. So this is your substrate. You can see your substrate is kind of like an hexagonal shape in green. Okay. And this is your enzyme. So you know that the substrate uh, when reacting with the enzyme will produce something. Okay. So say, for example, you, are, you want to do an experiment in the lab. So you've been reading a lot of literature and then the literature says enzyme A um, can react with substrate A over here and then you will get product B, for example. Okay. And then as a chemist, you just straight away synthesize your own enzyme and then you go and either synthesize or purchase your own substrate. You put it in and then suddenly nothing happens. And this can be because of the absence of either cofactor or coenzyme that changes the active site, the shape of the active site of the enzyme. Okay, so this is what is shown here. So you have your cofactor coenzyme getting into the active site, thus changing the active site. So now the shape is like this, more hexagonal. Initially, is it's a mix between um, kind of like a, a pinch. Um, okay, so that is an example. Um, and as, as I mentioned previously, hemoglobin, you have ions. Okay, so you have that's the four subunit, a four, four polypeptide chain, and then you have two ions. Okay, without these two ions, it will uh, hemoglobin will not work. It will not uh, transport. It will not carry oxygen or carbon dioxide from your um, body. Okay, so you need to have it together. Otherwise, it will not work at all. Okay, um, this is another example. Acetyl CoA is a coenzyme. The coenzyme, okay, the activation of a substrate, uh, it acts as a living group. So instead of activating um, the enzyme, so this time around, it's a coenzyme that still participate in the catalytic activity, but it activates the substrate. Okay, so this is the difference. So a coenzyme and cofactor does not really just activate the enzyme. Depending on the scenario, it might also activate the substrate. Okay, therefore. This enzyme, uh, acetyl-CoA, acts as a living group. And then, uh, for example, in this case, a uh, carbonyl reactivity. Uh, if you, you find information about thioester in malonate C1 versus C3, you can actually find um, acetyl-CoA over here that acts as, um, as, as the uh, kind of like a co-substrate, so to say. Okay, so it's not a coenzyme; uh, it's a co-substrate or a cofactor. It doesn't really do anything, but uh, it helps. Uh, well, of course, it's not that it doesn't do anything. Uh, once you have a lot of phosphate like this, it actually part of the component that carries enzyme. Uh, uh, sorry, carries energy um, to promote the catalytic activity of the enzyme. Okay, so without this, then. Uh, you might still have your reaction going, but at a very, very slow rate. So this is how um, it works. So you have your acetyl core a on the top left. You have your oxaloacetate um, in resonance forming. Okay. Oh, the picture is very, very ugly after I remove the background. Okay, so you have minus there, plus here, minus here, plus here, minus there, minus here. Okay, so you have an attraction force and in the presence of, um, this one is the enzyme, I think. Okay, so that's your substrate initially. You have water and then, oh, you regenerate your um, coenzyme. Acetyl-CoA enzyme, okay, and then you 
uh, create or, or synthesize a citrate. Citrate. You synthesize citrate. Okay, so uh, without this, it will not lower the activation energy. Therefore, you can still produce it, but at a slower rate. So this is the reference. I think, again, I've showed this previously. Um, you can actually, if you, you can either purchase it or um, find it on the internet somewhere. All right, <laughs> I'm sure you guys did. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, we're just gonna quickly do this. Uh, pull F. So probably next week I will not prepare any of this since um, I don't think we have time to actually capture uh, to cover up until lecture number six. So probably up until lecture number five, um, notes five that is posted on Spectrum. Okay. So how are you doing so far? Um, do you need to recap, redo, or mm, I don't know, maybe have a, a written tutorial for you guys to kind of like recap or you've learned all of this, you might want, wonder what's next and how is this related. Uh, it might be something that of interest or of concern. Uh, you are wondering the topic is rather broad. What should be, what would be in the exam? I have no idea what to cover. Okay, but it's digesting the info, which is still good. And after this, your stomach gonna digest food, right? I want a tutorial, to be honest, before our quiz on week seven. Okay, so far so good. Life is good. Um, so this this kind of like the the tutorial is in the sense that um, you can. I was hoping to do this as part of the tutorial so that I don't have to spend one lecture as a tutorial. But either is fine. I'll probably just prepare kind of like um, questions. Okay, I can prepare questions um, and you can just do it. Okay, that I think that will do. And we'll not, we will not be discussing it in the lecture because I'm not sure if we have enough time to actually cover all the... Um, all the sub topics okay so i can just prepare a tutorial uh questions i want to see what kind of question be asked so pretty much is the ones that we've been doing so those are the type of question that is being asked uh, at least not all of them but generally that is the question so an example is like this okay um oops i need to change so i need to sit in front Okay, so this is what you see now is so these are the types of questions that are going to be asked um, or that I normally ask. Eh, it takes a while. Yeah, of course, you can go back to the previous lectures um, and review the questions that being that was asked previously. Where are you? Avinesh, are you still there? They don't know. Let's make a do. But he managed to be me. Cannot find my my meat. My meat is missing. Oh, it's there. Okay. All right. So, um, I need to study. Really. My pull F is missing. Everywhere. Activities. Okay. So, um, L5, which one? Does it change yet? No. How about now? Yeah, I've done that. Let's change that. Cool. Alright, so these are some of the questions that, that um, can be asked. Uh, for example, Cuban constant for enzymatic activity can be defined as, so 
I'm not going to ask you guys to kind of like define this and that or do the mathematical equation. Um, I think it's inappropriate, but enough that you understand if um, the question asks you related to the equation, you know how to use it. For example, like this one, okay? So you know um, how do you write down the equilibrium constant for the enzyme and substrate? And then the question asks you something like this, then you know what will be the answer. So instead of, uh, I ask you guys, derive, how do you derive a mechanism maintain equation where you need to spend, I don't know, probably one page or two page. I'm not going to ask you something like that. Okay. It will be more on applied. So you have this knowledge. How do you actually apply it? Okay. So how many responses are there now? Okay. Have 10 responses. Um, so we have over here, just 18 of you, right? Okay. So a few more. Okay. So the first one, um, equilibrium constant for enzymatic activity can be defined as KEQ equals to, first one is enzyme over enzyme substrate complex. Second one is product over substrate. The third one is enzyme substrate, uh, over enzyme. And the fourth one is substrate over product. And all of these, if you see a bracket like a very nice bracket, it means a concentration, okay? All right, so we have, let's see, 12 responses, uh, enough lah, okay? 12 responses, so the correct answer is P over S, okay? So if you recall um, where we have E plus S, of course, everything needs to be in bracket, I'm just going to skip in the bracket, okay? And then you have the ES, and then you have the uh, E plus P, okay? So if you consider um, that one is either negligible or um, always there at a constant rate, so um, to consider the equilibrium constant of um, your reaction, it will be EP over ES, and because E is the uh, always regenerates, so you consider them as uh, at the same concentration, therefore you get P over S. Okay, so that's why the answer is P over S. All right, second one. Let's see, second one. It's that one. So name the structural level for the image. Image over here. What is it? Is it a primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, quaternary structure, um, quantity structure, or what type of structure? Spamox. That one. Spamox is over here. Thank you. So we have one tertiary. Okay, but of course, um, something like this, in, even in chemistry, you can have different types of drawings. So a variation of this um, question is different types of drawings. Okay, but the point is you need to understand what defines a primary structure, what defines a secondary structure, tertiary structure, quaternary structure. Okay, what are the definition and how do you actually differentiate between one to another? So normally, um, the issues that, that might exist uh, for student is how do you differentiate between tertiary and quaternary? Because sometimes a structure like this, you cannot really see it. Um, so normally, I'll, uh, I will just kind of like edit it so that it gives you guys a little bit of hint. How do you know whether it's tertiary or quaternary? Okay, so for example, this one, I just close for the way. The responses, which is fine. Okay, for this one, for example, um, the image is a bit messy, but um, so to know whether the easiest way to know whether it's a tertiary or quaternary is by looking at whether there are kind of like a mirror image or not. Okay, so that's the easiest. Because normally for a quaternary structure, there will be a mirror image. Normally, not always, but normally there, there will be a mirror image. 
So in this case, for example, um, you can't really see there's a mirror image because this one looks like, oh, well, it's, it's kind of like identical, right? It looks like it's a mirror image. But um, if you consider that bit over here, okay, where you have a beta sheet and helix, you have none over here. Okay, so um, you might say, oh, there's, there's a helix over there okay, at the very back. Yes, so it might be this, but if you consider the beta sheet, it's not on the other side. So you should know that okay, there's no mirror image, so there is a very high chance that this is a factory, okay, not the quaternary. Right, and the last one. Why does assumptions needed for the calculation of enzymatic reaction? So why do you need to have an assumption when you want to create um, the equation just now? Okay, why uh, do you need to have assumption? So unlike metal catalyst, enzymatic reaction goes both ways. Um, there are other factors that can contribute to the activity, for example, cofactor. There can be many stages of a reaction. Um, enzymatic activity lowers as time passes. So why do you need to have an assumption? So without this assumption, okay um what are the assumptions can i generally ask you guys online pun boleh jawab ya eh? what are the assumptions one of the basic assumption that we've touched previously hmm boleh try je it's fine kalau salah tak apa sebab bila salah kalau betul nanti you akan ingat daripada kalau you tak tahu ataupun you just think about it in your head you not sure whether your answer is right or not Some of it didn't change, yes, that's, that's correct juga, okay. But there are not the assumption that we are considering. That one is actually a fact, okay. Some of them keeps on denaturing. That one is a fact, it's not an assumption. Okay, what are the assumptions? When you have an um, reaction macam tu, kan, you have the E plus, E plus S, and then producing ES, producing E and P. So what are the assumptions before you can do any other benda? What is the assumption um, when you calculate equilibrium constant? Okay, what is the assumption of equilibrium constant? Just in here. What does equilibrium constant mean? Or what does equilibrium mean? It's a steady state. Okay, in a different, if different terms, it's a steady state reaction. So a steady state reaction is one of the assumptions. Okay, so two assumption yang kita dah touch lah. Of course, uh, sepatutnya today I'm going to touch about the other, other assumptions but um, don't think time is enough. Okay, so if you look at the question again, uh, why does assumption needed to calculation for the calculation of enzymatic reaction? So first one, unlike metal catalyst, enzymatic reaction goes both direction. Then that is correct. Okay, so um, if you consider the steady state reaction, that first statement is correct. Okay, so um, tengok nombor dua, <laughs> sebenarnya salah jawapan ni. <laughs> okay, uh, I didn't change that one, sepatutnya all of the above. <laughs> okay, so the last one should be all of the above. Um, I forgot to change because that's, that's the default answer. The default answer is none of the above. It should be all of the above. I should have changed that. Okay, so number one is correct. So number two is also correct. That's why ramai orang pilih. Okay, so number two is the most obvious that it is definitely correct. Um, number three, there can be many stages of reaction that can also be correct. Okay, as you see previously when you have a co-enzyme, uh, cofactor, so you need to activate something first. You need to activate the substrate and before the substrate can be catalyzed. Okay, so there might be multiple stages. Okay, number four, enzymatic activity lowers as time passes. Then also that one is correct because you cannot regenerate enzymes indefinitely. So there is always a reduction in enzymatic activity. Okay, so that's why you need to have an assumption because without assumption, you cannot do your calculation. You cannot do your prediction. You cannot do um, everything lah, pretty much to, to calculate the equilibrium constant, semua semua pun tak boleh. Okay, so you need to have the assumption uh, to say that the enzyme is perfect always. It doesn't degrade. You can always regenerate. Um, you need to do assumption that um, you don't need to have a cofactor. 
and the punya tu terus works. Okay, so those are the, the assumptions and we will look at the assumptions in a bit more detail next week. Okay, that's all for me. Um, sorry, ambil masa 10 minit extra. So you guys lambat sikit nak lunch. Okay, any other questions? Ada other questions tak nak tanya orang online? Tak ada eh? Okay, kalau tak ada that's all from me. Thank you. Um, see you guys next week. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. See you next week. See you next week, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor.